So our last but not least speaker today is um, uh, Chris Olsen. Um, before moving into the oil and gas industry, he previously worked for seven years in aerospace at, the, at Astra Rocket Company and developing advanced plasma per propulsion rockets, spaceflight hardware and conducting zero gravity experiments to fast track flight hardware. I'm impressed. <laughs> he now works for ConocoPhillips and he will have the last talk for today. All right, the real troopers are out here. Thank you for staying all the way to the very end. I hope that I won't bore you too much, but uh, I'm gonna change the pace a little bit and not talk about seismic or anything North Sea related, but I'm gonna talk about heavy oil extraction. How many are here familiar with that process? A few of you, but uh, still probably worthy of a review. But before I move on, I want to make sure to acknowledge the rest of my team on this project. It was a very large project and very involved. And without the help of Doug, Chris, James, Morgan, and Everett, uh, we wouldn't be nearly where we are today. So uh, with ConocoPhillips, we uh, have some acreage up in northeastern Alberta that we, is known as Sermont, which is joint operated with Total and it has quite a lot of oil in the Athabasca tar sands. In fact, uh, there's estimations in the trillions of barrels of oil uh, in the form of bitumen up there. And so far, we have only started to develop just the northern part of this acreage. Um, so uh, with, with heavy oil processes, the, it, you can either scoop it out of the ground with a shovel if it is shallow enough, but in those that are deep, too deep, uh, about a kilometer deep. It's not economic to do that, and so the best way of getting this bitumen out of the surface is to drill a pair of wells, uh, one uh, above another, separated by approximately five meters. One of them is an injection well where you inject steam, and the other will produce the steam, uh, condensed steam and emulsified bitumen out. Um, so they come in a well pair and you arrange them in a pad. And the whole point is that the native bitumen in the reservoir has such a high viscosity, if you were to go up and touch it, it'd feel like a hard rubber. But by raising the temperature, we can reduce the viscosity and the sands of the McMurray Formation, uh, in some cases, are in uh, over 10 Darcy. So that's why this works so well. You heat up the, the bitumen, it melts, and then you can pull it out. The problem is that... Uh, it costs us money to create the steam and on the orders of millions of dollars a year, and we have to pump it out somehow, either using gas lift or, or um, submersible pumps. And so at this point, the, uh, the team up there, in the production team, approached our group to say, we have a lot of steam going around there, and we want to make this thing the most efficient way possible. How do we allocate our steam in the, in the best way? for any given situation that we have. If we have to cut back on the steam or if we just want to use all the steam we have, what's the best way of chopping all that steam up and giving it to the best wells? So that ends up being no small task. But we know that they had years and years of production data. And this is the point where you say, okay, we have a lot of production data uh, over many different variables and they're closely tracked and they pair well enough with output data and then we can just feed it into an optimizer and have our solution. Simple, right? But this is a case where you realize that your data set is not as good as you think it is because we realize that there's a lot of holes in the data. There's labels and features that change name over time. Um, the biggest problem that we have with this data set is that, uh, and this is probably common across the industry, is that the wells have to share production hardware. They have to share a test separator with other wells on a given pad. Um, so you only get a measurement of what the well is actually producing uh, at most maybe once a week, maybe a few times a month if you're lucky. So in that case, you don't always have a continuous output for a given set of input variables. So then the question becomes, okay, can we even optimize? So our first approach to this was to try and find a continuous production proxy uh, using machine learning models. So uh, pulling the data out, all this uh, hard data, we 
pulled it out of three different databases. We pulled some subsurface information out of our ARC databases, um, historized production data out of our Pi historian, and also other parameters out of our uh, internal database. We, had to, we chose to go with hourly average production data. And of course, here's an example of what we, one well pair's history, what we were looking at about how many holes and patches that were in there. So this required a, a quite a big effort Plus, when we're dealing with steam injection, we are concerned with temperatures. And so some of the hardware configurations have changed time over the time that the production engineers have experimented with new configurations. So at some point, they have eight thermocouples. Other times, they have 120. And so at one point, we needed to standardize all of this data. And none of this would have been possible if we did not have a close working relationship with the subject matter experts out there in the field. So that is a critical part to doing any data science project. Once we had the data, then it was in our hands and we decided, okay, uh, we don't wanna jump straight into uh, super deep neural nets because uh, that can be complicated. Why not try the easy approach and see if that works? And in this case, we looked into the open source libraries of scikit-learn and decided just to throw any kind of regression algorithm at it. Um, taking one quick step back is that since we have production data and only very sparse uh, uh, test, well test data, it, it's a time series problem, but we kind of didn't want to treat it like a time series problem. So we took a step back from that and said, okay, when we inject a certain amount of steam in the, into the wells, we're gonna assume that it's gonna take a little bit of time. We don't know how long that time is gonna be. It's gonna take some time in order to affect its change melt the bitumen, and then get pumped out of the ground. And so we just started off saying, well, we're going to say that we injected the steam, and then we're going to predict, see how well the models predict six hours later, 12 hours later, and so on, to see if they can uh, be a good enough model in that case. So we ran a bunch of linear models, we ran a bunch of ensemble models, and we tried different optimizers within scikit-learn that can test out a lot of the different hyperparameters. On the linear models, we were able to use the gridded layouts. Uh, on the more complex models, the randomized layouts uh, were, were faster. And so by unleashing this out, uh, here's one example on a, a given well pair. And it, uh, here I am predicting the predicted value on the x-axis and the true values on the y-axis for both uh, the produced water and produced oil and you get a mixed bag. Some of the models turn out to be very, very bad. They didn't model anything at all. Uh, some were just marginally bad, but then you still left, were left with good models. So when we threw basically everything in the kitchen sink at it, how do you evaluate which model or which algorithm is the best? So we came up with a kind of an inverse scoring um, mechanism, kind of like how they do voting for college sports teams, where if the model ended up being in the top five predictive models according to your standard regression metrics, it earned a score of five points, then four points, three points, two points. And then we tried it over all of these different well pairs, five well pairs uh, using la uh, four different lag hours each. And we started to see a pattern that the extra trees regressor within scikit-learn was consistently within our top five of uh, no matter the case. So we went with the extra trees regressor from that point on. And here's an, out, uh, uh, an example of the output of, uh, in the time series of the predictions uh, for both oil and water in the green and blue curves and the, the well test data that was used. And in this case, we were randomly holding out um, the different hours in the well test. So that was our validation set and the, the training data is there in the black points and also in the red points for the water. So, it makes sense that a good model would then find its way to stab its way through all of the different well tests. So this, this turned out to be pretty good and we were happy with this at first. Uh, also, one of the other benefits of using a tree-based algorithm is that you can use it to define feature importances to say, okay, which of my variables are most impactful to the model? And this is kind of one first step of a sanity check. So we looked at this and said, okay, Here's the, the top variables for the 60 or so that we passed in. And then we did a similar scoring mechanism for all of the models to say, okay, over all of the different wells and models we're doing, what are our top 20 variables? Do they make sense? And turns out 
that if you're trying to predict how much oil is produced, knowing how much you're pumping out is a very predictive variable. So yes, there, there were some definite, uh, like, duh moments in there that yes, those are uh, gonna be the most important. We also decided to look at the, um, uh, another a second sanity check is asking the, the production engineers about the, if we're going to uh, predict a certain amount of steam oil ratio or water uh, steam water ratio, have they made sense over it? If I were to predict that, does that make sense over the history of the well pairs? And it turns out that this, this model is actually doing a pretty good job. Um, the next step would be then, since we had uh, created these models, more production data has come on. So it makes sense to then say, okay, how well is the model doing on the latest round of data that it has not seen? And in some cases, that did very bad. Other cases, it did okay. And this is one example where you see here in the green that it's tracking the oil, um, the oil prediction is tracking the actual test values, even with variance, pretty well. It's getting the shape kind of good for the water, and the, the brown is the sum of the emulsion. Uh, but it, we're mainly interested in the oil, so we were happy with this. So we said, okay, let's keep going forward. This is a good job. So naturally, what did we do? We decided to train all of our well pairs in the entire field. Uh, it took about um, a few hours to train one well pair for one scenario, one partitioning mechanism. We have an on-premise uh, high-performance computing cluster, so we decided to train everything on, and on that and ended up with a quarter million models later. And what we're predicting here is the um, mean average error of the first well test after we finish training to the second well test after training. And what you would like to see is your errors be down in this lower left-hand corner. And uh, in this demonstration, we have a lot of models that are just going crazy. They're going all over the place. But in this lower left-hand corner, that is an acceptable error range. And we have at least 151 of our well pairs stuck in there. So we'll, we'll, we'll take those best well, uh, well models and run with those to, so that we can get the best field coverage possible. We're also estimating that since this is a time series and the, the system is constantly changing, we're going to have to retrain our models frequently. And so mainly on a once a month basis. That's why we want to at least be predictive for at least the first one to two well tests because that corresponds to approximately two to three weeks. Every, every two to three, three weeks you would retrain. We actually were able to convince management that if we were to put forward some of our best models that we could actually take them out into the field and test them and see how well they predict on live data, where we were given kind of given the keys to a few of the well pairs and we could dictate what the steam in injection rates could be and what the splits of the, between the heel and the toe injection could be. And we were able to leave these well pairs on the test separators for a continuous period of about two weeks, which is uh, very rare for, for their operations up there. But they said, okay, let's try this out. And so what we did is we took our best performing models for each of these well pairs and uh, computed a partial dependency plot uh, on there so that we could see what the models were predicting according to the actual um, previous data that was there. And that gave us guidance for what, uh, uh, what, what settings, what experiment settings we were going to do. So those are shown in the green dots. We wanted to get the data where we didn't have a lot of data historically. One of the real big fears with this is that would the wells respond to our changes in the steam on the time scales that we were interested in? The, there, there were some real skeptics out there saying that they, they wouldn't, that we would introduce transients and we wouldn't see anything. But luckily enough for us is that they did respond within the time frame. Um, here you see that we're plotting out, here's the well test data in green, and we were able to, in this case, we're reducing the steam and then bringing it back up in a stair-step manner, and we do see our oil production change in that time frame. Same thing with a different well pair where we're dropping the steam and then bringing it back up again. So we were able to at least vary it and measure it. So let's see how well the models did. On those two wells in the previous one, we can see that, okay, each one of these dashed lines represents where we're retraining the data. Or retraining, the, sorry, we're using new data to retrain the models. And 
in most cases, the, the models were predicting the change pretty well. They weren't predicting the magnitude uh, hardly, hardly at all. Uh, and even when we are retraining it, it's, there's still features in here that are trying to pull the predictions down. But after enough retrains and seeing more data over time, it ends up doing a decent job. Not, not always good, but a decent job. And this, one, this well is a very recent well pair, so we didn't have hardly any training data with it. And I believe it still ended up doing a pretty good job. So that gave us, seeing these results gave us enough confidence that we could actually predict what the output was going to be. And so then we can carry forward and, and actually create an optimizer. Um, here's kind of like the big picture view. Uh, I probably don't want to talk about this slide, but even if we retrain it, the models will still capture the big picture. But it wouldn't it have been nice to have captured some of these events to where it's going down. We didn't miss it. We didn't get that before. But anyways, uh, for the sake of time, I'll skip this one. We went forward and created an optimizer. And one of the first tempting things to do when you're creating an optimizer is say, OK, let me just consider every single possible combination of, of states out there, and I'll just choose the best one. Um, that's the brute force method. And if we were to do that, given the number of well pairs we have, we start seeing that it's an O of n factorial problem. And given all the well pairs, we see that that's how many combinations it would take. It would take longer than the universe has been in existence to compute. And so that was not feasible. We tried considering other off-the-shelf optimizers. And the one that made the sense the most and worked the most was to use a dynamic programming approach to where you make the computation once and then form a, a pathway back to only the most viable combinations. And so you reduce the problem from an n factorial down to an uh, O of n squared problem. But then looking back at the models, then that became even worse because we realized, OK, when we started this whole thing with the extra trees regressors and the notion of using lag hours uh, for our models is that we were expecting that the lag hour would be similar or at least um, correlated to the age of the steam chamber. So the younger the steam chamber, the less time it would take for the steam to make a change in the reservoir and then get the oil out. The older wells with the bigger steam chambers would take longer. We, ended, we did not end up seeing that. The models were not sensitive to the lag hours. So that gave us a little bit of an unsettling feeling. Secondly, if we wanted to optimize and, and compare models, if the models did not have the same lag hour, you'd be trying to predict a, with a model that says, I'm predicting three hours later with the one that could be predicting uh, 38 hours later, and that wasn't good either. And then the last thing that drove us, uh, is driving us away from the extra trees models is that you get a rectilinear solution space. So if your settings are too close to each other, you could actually be predicting the exact same output for the same, uh, for different con uh, uh, input configuration. And that's not good either. You'd say, okay, which one is the best? Of these eight choices, they're all equal. Which one do I choose? So we needed to break this symmetry and this is what pushed us towards going towards a neural net solution. So we looked at doing a combination of a feedforward neural net, a virtual flow meter, along with a recurrent neural net. And I'll talk about the architecture that I used right here. Um, uh, I'm calling this kind of a hybrid neural net approach because I'm taking the, what I feel is the interaction terms in, in the subsurface and feeding them in a different method. So I'm taking the, the terms that I'm feeding in that are impo most important to the reservoir and just feeding them straight through the neural net. But then I'm bundling up two other uh, groupings of input variables, ones that deal with the lift of getting the, the emulsion out of the ground and another one that's dealing with how it's handled at the surface. I just want, at some point, I want some variable to represent the lift, how much is it coming out, because I'm not actually measuring lift. I'm measuring a pump rate, or I'm measuring a target variable. I wanted the neural net to figure out how much it's lifting out, and also what the choke is going to be, giving these other parameters. Uh, it trained well with the uh, ReLU activations, and ended up training well. It ended up uh, fitting uh, blind and holdout sets. And with a time series, it's always great to compare to a naive, uh, the naive prediction. I have. One more slide. So you have to at least be beat the last prediction, predicted value. 
uh, and that and it ends up that we're doing pretty good here. We then use this this virtual flow meter to fill in the gaps in our missing uh, our missing production data and feed in a complete series of predicted oil and water along with other input variables and feed them into a recurrent neural net which does deals with sequences. So we're feeding in 12 or 24 hours ahead and then predicting the next 12 and 24 hours in advance. And this is a case where it's following this black line pretty well and curving down. There are some series where it's wanting to pull up, but on average, it's doing a very good job following these curves. And this is what we're going to use for forecasting our, our oil for our optimizer. Uh, I won't go into this too much, but we're, we're in the process of implementing this as we speak. So I'd be happy to take any questions.